Hello, and welcome to this edition of the CSIAC podcast series. This is a multi-part series entitled C++ Models, conducted by CSIAC subject matter expert, Dr. James Fawcett. This series will explore different conceptual models underlying the C++ programming language. This particular podcast will discuss C++ polymorphism. Hi. Uh, this is the fifth video in a sequence of videos on C++ models. Uh, in this video, we're going to focus on polymorphism. So uh, polymorphism is uh, intimately associated with inheritance uh, in C++. We discussed uh, inheritance in, in a little bit of detail in the last video. Uh, <clears throat> so let's suppose we have a base class B and we derive publicly from that a class D. Now, um, uh, we could, in fact, define multiple derived classes, D1, D2, D3, and so on. And uh, the interesting thing is that C++ supports binding a base class pointer or base class reference, reference to any one of those derived classes. So I can construct a base pointer, B star PB, equals the address of D1. I could also assign a, a base reference BR to the class D2. Understand that an ampersand on the right-hand side of an equal sign is an address. The ampersand on the left-hand side, you know, uh, uh, adjacent to a type is a reference. Uh, so anyway, I can define um, the, the language will allow me to bind these derived objects to pointers or references uh, for the base, typed as pointers or references to the base. And we'll see why we might want to do that in just a second. Uh, let's suppose we have a function, uh, fun, so it might be declared void fun uh, b star pb. So it's a function that doesn't return anything and accepts a pointer to a base. Uh, I can, that function will accept uh, a, a base pointer uh, even if it is bound to a derived object. And in fact, that's what polymorphism, that's the basis for polymorphism. Uh, <clears throat> we uh, can pass to this function a reference to any drive, a, a pointer to any drive object, as long as it's type, the pointer type is base. So uh, that allows us to substitute uh, in this function um, uh, various derived uh, instances, D1, D2, D3, pointers to them, and the function will operate on those derived objects using the syntax of the base class. And since the, the, the interface of the base class hasn't changed just because we added a new drive class, uh, the function doesn't know the difference. It just does its base thing to those pointers. And the effect is that we call uh, the, that function on the derived object. And those functions, the content of those functions may be different, as we'll see in just a second. So inheritance supports uh, two features, inheritance of implementation, where uh, you know, we, drive, uh, we uh, acquire all the methods and the, all the data of the base class. Inheritance always does that. Uh, and uh, uh, the other feature, uh, the more important of the two features, is substitution. Uh, we can substitute in this function b that accepts a base pointer, we can substitute any one of the derived uh, 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 objects um, through, a, through a base pointer. And the function doesn't distinguish, you know, doesn't have to have any knowledge specialized to those derived classes. It just uses the base interface on those derived objects. Very, very powerful, as we'll see. <clears throat> Here's how this works, uh, virtual function dispatching. So uh, here, suppose we have a class B, uh, it has a 
base constructor that accepts a name and it has a virtual destructor and a virtual member, uh, member function one and virtual member function two and a non-virtual function who. And it has a private virtual function uh, named, uh, 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 with a name name and it has a private data member name. And presumably member function one or the constructor may call this uh, string name resulting in some sort of mutation of this name value. In uh, the D class that publicly derives from B, it has a D constructor. It has a virtual, destru uh, virtual destructor. It does not override MF1, but it does override MF2. So this is saying that D, if uh, MF1 is called on D, it's going to just use the base, base code. But if MF2 is called on D, it's going to use the uh, derived code, the code that the derived class provided in this override. Also, D provides another virtual function, MF3, that's not part of this base protocol. And it over, uh, did an override on this uh, base virtual function string. Now, notice this is private, and uh, class D can access protected member data of the base class, but it can't access private directly. But the point of overriding uh, this pr uh, private function, it can override it. It can't access it, but it can override it. And what that means is that when member function one calls string, if it's uh, called on a derived class object, it'll use the derived version of this private function. D can't call it, but when B calls it, uh, when the a base pointer calls it, if it's attached to derived object, it's going to use the uh, virtual, uh, you know, the overridden virtual function, even though it's private. And uh, D, for some reason, has another uh, data member widget that's presumably used in MF3. Uh, so uh, let's take a look at uh, the layout now. Uh, for uh, each class with virtual functions, there's an associated virtual function pointer table. So here for B, we have a pointer to MF1 that points to B's code. We have a pointer MF2, points to B's MF2. We have a pointer to name that points to B's name and a pointer to the, to the uh, destructor. That's all defined, these linkages are all defined in the virtual function pointer table for the base class. And every base class object has a pointer to its, if it has a virtual function pointer table, then the object will have a pointer to the virtual function pointer table. So when on a base pointer, I call uh, MF2, uh, if I'm a, if I'm bound to a base object, that will just go here, look up MF2, and call BMF2. Now the derived class uh, also has a virtual function pointer table, and in this case, it didn't override MF1, so MF1 points back to B's MF1, but it did override MF2, so its pointer points to uh, D's MF2. Uh, it, um, uh, it, it, uh, defined a new MF3 function and, uh, that's because it's virtual, it has a slot in the virtual function pointer table, uh, that points to D's code. And the uh, name function points to, because the D overrode it, it points to the D's code. Now again, D can't directly invoke this function, but when D invokes a you know member function one, if member function one uses that uh, name function, then 
if I'm a derived object, it'll use the derived version. Now, uh, so here's a base object. It has a pointer to the base virtual function pointer table, and it has a pointer to its one uh, data member name. And here's a derived object that has a pointer to its virtual, the derived virtual function pointer table. Notice that it has a, uh, it's inherited the uh, base name, even though that's private, it's still inherited. It's not accessible directly to the drive class, but it has to have that function because when the, a derived object, a pointer to the base class bound to a derived object calls MF, uh, MF1, if MF1 is, uh, is uh, uh, calling name, then this will call the, uh, uh, the name function, and that will manipulate this data member. So the derived object has to have all the data of the base class. Now it also has a slot for widget, the new item uh, added to the drive class that presumably is manipulated by the new member function MF3. Notice that I overrode MF2 and I have an override declaration for a name, even though it's private, you know, I can override it. Uh, in C++, unlike the managed languages, in C++, the override is optional. I could leave it off and this would work fine. Uh, the only thing that override does here, the fact that this is typed as virtual, does the same thing that override does in the managed languages. What override does here is ensure that you are actually in the derived class overriding a base class. It, that, uh, you, you know, if you say override, but you made a spelling error in the function name, this, the compiler will detect that and say, hey, you're overriding a function that doesn't exist in the main, uh, in the base class. And that'll, you know, that's just a safety check against typos uh, as you're developing code. So anyway, this is how virtual function uh, dispatching works. Okay. So um, really powerful mechanism. Let's explore an application of that. So here we have a class hierarchy that represents a software development organization. This might be for a piece of code that um, uh, you know supports uh, the various uh, roles in the organization. Maybe it has job descriptions for each role and uh, pay rates and all that sort of stuff. So whatever. Uh, but uh, what this what this hierarchy has, it has a person class that has an iPerson contract and interface to the iPerson class. And it has an iSoftware engineer interface that, that declares a contract for whatever software engineers do. Contract for what people do, contract for so what software engineers do. A software engineer, this happens in the code I wrote to be an abstract class, um, is both a person and a software engineer, it represents both. And devs are software engineers, so they're both people and, you know, they implement both of those. Devs are software engineers. Team leads are software engineers through the dev. A team lead is a dev, so it's also a software engineer. Program manager, a project manager is a software engineer. And a project manager may have some additional stuff. You know, um, he's given a project, and that project has, as an immutable part of it, a budget. And eventually, the project will accumulate some documents and probably has none at the beginning. And it may accumulate some code, and it probably has none at the beginning. And the devs and the team leads interact with that code baseline uh, in a, with using relationships. You know, dev uh, um, uh, does a pull on a repository in the baseline and does whatever modifications um, that need to be done and then pushes it back to the baseline. So, <clears throat> Uh, software engineers inherit, inherit the person type and implement the iSoftware engineering interface. And that's an abstract class for all the software engineers. Any function that accepts a pointer to software engineer will also accept pointers to devs, team leads, and program managers, just like we discussed on the previous slide. 
So if I software engineer defines a pure virtual method, say do work, any derived class can override that method. Devs do work the way devs do it. Team leads do work the way team leads do it. Project managers do work that project managers do. So they're each defining that do work function that's uh, for which we have a contract in this interface. Uh, they're each um, uh, implementing those, uh, their own versions of those functions. And so now if uh, when I have an object and I say do work, if, it, if I'm pointing, you know, I have a, I have a uh, pointer to this uh, interface, but it's actually bound to a dev, and I call do work on that pointer, it's going to do work the way a dev does. If my pointer instead is bound to a project manager, it's going to do work like a project manager does. So that's powerful. Now, even more powerful, notice what happened. So the designer of this hierarchy says, oh, I forgot QA, okay? A week later, he discovers, oh, I forgot Q the QA. I gotta have a QA type. And so he adds QA, okay? And he overrides the do work method. Nothing else changes. I may have a whole bunch of functions here that, you know, uh, the, the do work function doesn't change. I may have a bunch of other functions that either are member functions of this, you know, uh, declared in the interface, or they're functions that accept uh, pointers or references to um, uh, anything that derives from uh, this interface. So uh, it gives us incredible flexibility. Um, we have changing requirements or something we forgot or we need to fix something. Uh, we can make those changes, we can add that new type and nothing else changes. We haven't broken any other code. You know, let's suppose that we have a, a graphical editor that a CAD system is using and there may be uh, three million lines of code that depend on that graphical editor. And if I uh, want to add a new type, you know, to that graphical editor, uh, I want to add a memory bank type to that CAD graphical editor. Uh, I don't have to go back and find all those places in that three million lines of code where I call that graphical editor because the interface to the graphical editor hasn't changed, okay? All I did was add a new instance, uh, a new uh, drawing type, a new graphical type called uh, memory bank or some gate, some special gate or whatever. Uh, and uh, nothing broke, so it's very, very powerful. Uh, uh, templates uh, using polymorphism provides a great way of writing flexible code, one of two major ways in C++. The other major way is templates, and we're gonna discuss that in the next video. So uh, with that, uh, I'd like to thank you for your attention and invite you to watch uh, the next video in the sequence, which will focus on C++ templates. On behalf of the CSIAC, we would like to thank you for viewing this podcast. We hope you found the content informative and useful. If you would like to provide feedback or comments, please visit our website at www csiac.org, where you can also find additional content to review. Thank you.